George Lucas really presents us with a believable, possible image of how we might get across the galaxy quickly. Um, you know, Einstein in his special theory of relativity tells us that we can't travel faster than the speed of light. And that has always frustrated science fiction fans horribly mm -hmm. because, you know, hey, if we want to get to those other planets where there's life and have a civilization and get to know them and have an evil empire and take over <laughs> the galaxy, we need to be able to get between star systems pretty quickly. Um, but Einstein's general theory of relativity tells us a more complex truth that allows some of these different possibilities. It tells us that mass and energy are connected to space and time, which means that we can use mass or energy to manipulate space-time. We can fold it, warp it, distort it, or expand it. And if we can do that, then we don't need to go faster than the speed of light. We can simply alter space to make the trip shorter. If we learn how to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and That's if we the have trick. The energy to do it. What kind of minds will we need to pull this off? Well, I think part of it is that we need some brilliant minds to come up with huge energy sources that allow us to manipulate greater energies that make nuclear nuclear bomb level energies seem like nothing. Controllable, and it must be controllable. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Uh, so the method that I think they're, is closest to what they're using in Star Wars is to travel through a wormhole, which is one of these distortions of space-time. It's uh, a passageway, a tunnel, from one point to another point that does not go through regular space but goes through other dimensions. Mm -hmm. You were talking about these other dimensions earlier. And scientists do believe they exist, and they call these other dimensions hyperspace, which is exactly what Han Solo says. He says, we're going to make the jump to hyperspace. So perhaps what they're showing in Star Wars is they are um, going into a, a wormhole, creating a tunnel, a hole in space that takes them from the place where they are to the place where they want to be without going through all the space in between. And if you can do that, then you don't need to go terribly fast because you're creating virtually a shortcut. Now, these wormholes, according to Einstein's theory, they theoretically exist. We haven't yet observed one, but we think they're out there. Um, now, it's unlikely that we're going to find one that happens to go from where we are to where we want to be. I've been looking for one in my backyard that would take me to Harrison Ford's house, and I <laughs> haven't found it yet. Um, but perhaps when we can manipulate these great energies, and I'm talking about uh, energies, you take the mass of Jupiter and convert that into energy, that's how much we need to do this. Um, if, we could, if we can manipulate those energies, we could potentially make a wormhole of our own that takes us where we want to go. Well, that would, that would take, I think, some great minds to, to understand. We have to understand how space is warped. Um, we think of space as this uniform, vast um, thing. But in reality, it, it is filled with curves and warps from every mass in it. It's hard to think in the four dimensions that you need to to, to, to understand deal with Einstein. It. Yeah. But if you think of space as a sheet in two dimensions, okay, or as a trampoline, okay, and now we take a bowling ball, a mass of any kind, and we put it in the center of the trampoline, it's going to sink down. And if we're standing at the edge of the trampoline, we are going to slide down toward the bowling ball. Mass is distorted, and we are drawn toward the mass. That's the force of gravity. That's why we don't float off the earth and our feet stay on the ground, because we are drawn by that warp of space toward masses. So as all of these masses in the universe 
uh, warp space, they create these curvatures, like the curvature of the trampoline, that we can then use to create the shortcut. So if you think of this um, sheet, this two-dimensional sheet of space, now having a big curvature, so say you have a sheet hanging over a clothesline, okay, now it's, it's a big curvature, and say you're on one side of the sheet, and you'd like to get to a spot that's hanging on the other side of the clothesline. But normally, you have to go up the sheet to the clothesline and down the other side. That is the fastest route. But if you don't stay in those dimensions of space, if you go into another dimension, you could create a little shortcut tunnel from the spot on the sheet where you are to the spot on the sheet on the other side without going all the way up to the clothesline and over. How does this differ then from Star Trek's technology, Star Trek now, of warp t- warp drives? Yeah, well, it's uh, there's a scientist who loves Star Trek who came up with this theory, Dr. Miguel Alcubierre, uh, of how we might warp space, which is a really, really fascinating theory. Um, and this has to do with expanding and contracting space. So back at the Big Bang, let's go back for a moment, Um, space expanded out from a single point. That's what we believe happened at the Big Bang. So it's not that masses expanded out into space. There was no space at all. There was just a single point. Which we have a difficult time understanding. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, But then space expanded out, and it's still expanding. And it expanded at extremely high speeds. Space can expand at speeds faster than the speed of light. There's no limitation on it. Um, So if you think of now space as this balloon, okay, a deflated balloon, and we draw two dots on the balloon, say an inch apart, and now we inflate the balloon, you can imagine the dots are moving apart. Okay, once the balloon is inflated, the dots are now six inches apart. They have moved far apart, but they haven't really moved at all. So using this type of um, expansion and contraction of space, uh, Dr. Alcubierre imagines how we could use this uh, warp speed of Star Trek. Um, Say that uh, Han Solo has just left Tatooine. And he wants to go to Alderaan, another planet. Right, in his Millennium Falcon. Yeah. Uh, oh, we love that ship. Yeah. Uh, he could potentially create a space-time disturbance that would expand the space between the Millennium Falcon and Tatooine behind him, making Tatooine recede many light years away. Okay, that balloon is blowing up, and the two points are separating, and it would then this uh, disturbance that he creates would contract the space between the Millennium Falcon and Alderaan, where he wants to go, but letting the air out of the balloon and bringing Alderaan close. So Han Solo could get to Alderaan without really moving at all. Now, would that affect, let's say, other craft in the area or just you? I think that would be a problem, would be we would need to localize this disturbance so that it would only affect you. Uh, Dr. Alcubierre describes it as surfing a wave, that it's sort of this wave of disturbance that you are riding toward your goal. Um, There's a lot of details to be worked out about it. Um, Part of the problem is what you're talking about. How widespread would this disturbance be? Exactly. I mean, would it suck in everybody who was close by you? Uh, I mean, maybe I don't want to go, you know? Right. (laughs) Suddenly you're there. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It might just take you. Right. Um, He he believes it it can be somehow localized or that it can be set up as a kind of highway where there are these little um, stations along the way that are creating the disturbance. And so if you want to go to Alderaan, you get on this highway and suddenly you're there. And if you don't want to go, you stay off the highway. Um, Of course, this would take huge energies uh, to accomplish, similar to creating a wormhole. And we'd also need some exotic matter to make this happen. And exotic matter is, is matter that has negative 
mass or negative energy associated with it. This is something that is theorized by Einstein and something that we believe we, we've observed the effects of, but we haven't actually you know, captured any exotic matter. Um, so if we could have that, that would help us to create this kind of repulsive force between the Millennium Falcon and Tatooine that we're leaving so that we can expand the space there. It also sounds like if we're doing this, we may also stumble into some mechanism of time travel. Is that well, possible? Absolutely. I mean, when you talk about rapid space travel or manipulating space-time, all of these techniques can be used for time travel as well. A, a wormhole can just as well lead from one place to another place or from one time to another time. Because really in, in Einstein's theory, there is not much difference between space and time. They're interconnected and they are really part of the space-time continuum. So if we wanted to create a wormhole going from the present to the past, or going from the present to the future, that's theoretically possible. That's exciting, if we can ever get there. It's very exciting. Of course, you know, then are we going to mess it up? If we go to the past, you know, we, we can't mess anything up or we're going we're gonna to be in trouble. Uh, but, yeah, it's very exciting because even if we could create this tunnel and look through it, to create a window into the past or the future and see see what we see. They used to have deflectors. You know, we've seen them in Star Trek. We've seen them in Star Wars, blocking, uh, you know, missiles and uh, laser torpedoes. Uh, will we ever get to a point where we seriously can develop some kind of electronic shield that blocks anything from incoming? Maybe we could just encircle the United States, for example. Oh, well, that would be very nice. Um, I think as far as deflector shields like on a spacecraft, the best possibility that I see that seems like a, something we could develop is uh, cold plasma. Um, plasma is the fourth state of matter. You know, we have solid, you heat up the solid, we have a liquid, you heat up the liquid, you get a gas. You heat up the gas you get a plasma. This is what happens when the atoms in the gas come apart so that the electrons that are normally orbiting around the nuclei separate from them. So you've got free floating electrons and free floating nuclei. And since these are charged particles, positive and negative charges, it makes this plasma behave in a very strange way. Some people have noted that plasma behaves almost as if it's alive um, because it has these very, very strange properties. The sun is made of plasma, uh, lightning bolts, fluorescent lights, and of course our exciting new plasma TVs use plasma. Um, usually plasma is created at very high temperature because we're heating up this gas to give it more energy so that the, the atoms will separate. But there's a scientist now who's become very, very skillful at creating cold plasmas. So we don't want to use a hot plasma and create a field of that around our spaceship because it's going to melt the spaceship. So that would be a bad thing. But if we can use a cold plasma and create a field of it around our spaceship, the cold plasma could dissipate or deflect microwave beams or particle beams and if it was a dense enough plasma, it could even protect against lasers or uh, vaporized projectiles that were thrown at it. Can you imagine what this would do, Gene, to warfare if we were the first to develop this? Ugh. Oh, my gosh. They're, they're, you know, they're very concerned about our satellites in space. Yes, you know? and, and, and with good reason. Yes, and trying to figure out a way to protect our satellites uh, from attack. Um, the, the really, one of the cool things about this cold plasma is that it could also potentially serve as a sort of cloaking device, hiding the satellite or the spaceship from radar, uh, deflecting the radar beams away. 
because that's part of what the plasma does. So you could have satellites that then are invisible to the enemy and cannot be attacked. Um, cold plasma could also create a, a sort of window in your spaceship. If you if you have, you know, in Star Wars we see these um, beautiful big windows on the spaceships where they look out and they watch the battle going on and all that. And, you know, what sort of glass are you putting in that window that's going to hold hold in the atmosphere on the ship and hold out the vacuum of space? Well, we've got that, though, in our uh, – the Apollo had something, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm sure the space shuttle has a window. Uh, it may, I know it has a window. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, they have something you know, that they something... pull down over it. Right. <laughs> right. Um, if we want something big, though, or if we want something – um, say, like on the Death Star, they have the landing bay where they pull the Millennium Falcon in with the um, tractor beam, and they let the Falcon come in, and then they kind of uh, close the um, the landing bay opening. We still see space there, but there's people walking around, and they're breathing air. Right, right, so there's yeah. There's some sort of um, barrier there. We could use the cold plasma as that kind of barrier where we could see outside but we would still be able to have an atmosphere inside the ship. So it offers a lot of great possibilities, and it's, um, it's only in the last couple of years that um, we've been able to create such plasmas, uh, and, and they're getting very good at it. They're putting just an electric current into the gas to excite the molecules enough to, uh, to separate. Gene, what fascinated you the most about Star Wars? Oh, man. Uh, well, it would probably have to be the Force. Yeah, me too. I was just going to say it. You know, it's just its so great to imagine what it would be like to be a Jedi, to be able to do those things, to look into the past and the future, influence the weak-minded. I've often wished I had that power. Now, see, of anything that George Lucas found and created for that series, the Force, to me is the most realistic. I think it's out there. Mm -hmm. And all you have to do is learn how to tap into it. I mean, this has been a The Force has been with us since the beginning of time. You know, I think we have always wanted to understand the universe and hoped that there was some kind of unifying power that connected everything, that sort of made sense of everything, and that allowed us to be in tune with our world around us. And so we see that in a lot of a lot of myth, a lot of religion, um, that there is some kind of force. Well, I think his vision was of a very mystical force that did not quite follow scientific principles that seemed to violate some scientific principles, but that uh, explained many uh, of the phenomenon that people have observed over the years that, you know, that scientists have said, well, that's impossible. Uh, you know, the ability to transmit thoughts, the ability to sense something happening at a distance. You know, we might, we've heard stories about people sensing the death of a loved one, um, the ability to sense the past or the future, um, the ability to sense the presence of someone um, or to sense a change of some kind. And also uh, the force is connected to life after death. We see, you know, the Jedi still existing after their death in some way. Um, and, and this force has a, a dark side and a light side, uh, which also reflects a lot of our um, religious beliefs in that there is, you know, something uh, that can, we can use it for good or we can use it for evil. Um, so I think he didn't want it to be easily explained by science, although he's given us some hints about how it works, um, certainly more in the, in the later movies. Uh, where he talks about the midi chlorians, you know, that um, mm-hmm. the people in the Star Wars universe perhaps are a little different than us. They have these midi chlorians in their bodies that allow them to be in touch with this force. And I think that's one of the most interesting aspects and, and allows me anyway a path to see how it might connect to science in some ways. 
I mean, I think the thing that's so difficult to explain about the fourth is it it allows you to do so many different things. If it just allowed one of these things, then I think that would be easier to understand, but that it's connected with all of these things. Um, but when he introduced the midichlorians, that really got me thinking about, for example, uh, migratory birds. And, you know, we always have wondered, how do they know where to migrate? Why do the swallows always return to Capistrano? Um, we've discovered now that they have these molecules in the retinas of their eyes that are called cryptochromes. And these molecules can sense changes in magnetism. Okay, so here we have a force, magnetic field, mm -hmm. which is around planet Earth. It exists. And when that changes, they're really going to get screwed up. <laughs> yeah. You know what? Exactly. Um, the birds can sense this force due to these molecules in their bodies, which change depending on the magnetism. And they've now discovered that these cryptochromes are connected to the region of the bird's brain that sees. So that when the bird looks around, the bird is actually seeing somehow the magnetic field of the earth and is able to orient itself to know where it is on Earth based on how the magnetic field looks and then to, to migrate to the place where the magnetic field looks the way it's supposed to look for, you know, the summer home of the birds or the winter home of the birds. Now, there are also another good example of this is there are fish who generate electrical pulses in, in the ocean. And so they're basically creating an electrical field around them. Their own wave, so their to speak. Own little, their own little wave. And when another fish comes into their field, they sense a deformity in their field and they realize another fish is there. This is really useful if you're a fish that lives very deep in the ocean and there's no light around. So you can create this electrical field around you. And then when someone disturbs the force, you sense their presence. So if we had um, midichlorians, if these midichlorians were uh, not only emitting the force, creating a little field of the force around us, but also uh, uh, if we had force receptors, we could sense the force like the birds do. Um, we could certainly sense a disturbance in the force. We could know if Darth Vader is in the next room. We could know if um, the people of Alderaan had been killed through some mechanism like that. And, you know, who's to say that we don't have, uh, that, you know, that we're not sensing changes in the world around us, maybe without realizing it. Why do you tie in quantum mechanics with the force? Well, you know, the force violates so many principles of science um, that, you know, scientists always laugh at it and say it's ridiculous, like they do with a lot of Star Wars. But so does quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics violates some of the very same principles of science. Um, quantum mechanics, of course, deals with things at the level of the very small, the quantum level of, of atoms. Um, and one thing that one principle that the force violates is locality. Uh, in the in the in initial Star Wars movie, you might remember that Princess Leia's planet is blown up by the Death Star. And then Obi-Wan Kenobi, who is light years away on the Millennium Falcon, instantaneously senses the death of all those people on the planet. Now, you know, if the force exists, then a disturbance in the force should not be able to travel faster than the speed of light. So it should take years before Obi-Wan senses their death. But the force seems to connect all things in an instantaneous way that transcends time and space. And that's the very thing that quantum mechanics also does. It doesn't seem to be uh, dependent on distance, that it doesn't seem to be something that gets harder the farther away it goes. Uh, that's that principle of locality that I was talking about earlier. Um, you know, and quantum mechanics violates that same scientific principle that um, you know, that says, you know, hey, these two things can't possibly communicate. They're too far away, and they certainly can't communicate instantly. It'll take time for that signal to go. And in quantum mechanics, that's not the case at all. 
Um, I don't know if you're familiar with um, the theories of Dr. David Bohm, but he was a um, protege of Einstein's who studied quantum mechanics, and um, both Einstein and Bohm were very unhappy with the way that quantum mechanics was explained. You know, that, well, an electron, it could be here in the atom or it could be there in the atom. And it's really not anywhere. There's just different probabilities that it's in different places. And they were very dissatisfied with that, as I think we all are. You know, hey, the electron has to be somewhere, doesn't it? And what Bohm came up with was a theory about a force, the quantum potential force, which he said connects all things, uh, allows instantaneous communication between all things, and that it dictates where the electron is. If we find it in this spot rather than that spot, it's because there's a reason. It's because the quantum potential force made it be there. Um, so that his theory has a lot in common with George Lucas's view of the force. The one difference of it is that because this quantum potential force controls all things and connects all things, it doesn't allow us to control it. You know, with the force, there's this dual aspect to it, that it can control our actions, but we can also control it. And uh, in Bohm's theory, anyway, this quantum potential force would control all things, but it wouldn't allow us to control it. 